We live in a world predicated by myth, superstition, and fairy tales. Thousands of years of human history stretch behind us, rich with tapestries of gods, traditions, cultures, and rules. Rules about how the cosmos work, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, the meaning of destiny, the meaning of birth, and the meaning of apocalypse. But what do you do when the universe doesn't feel like it works anymore? What do you do when the worldview cracks and your idea of man and woman don't feel like they align with any more of the preordained idyllic molds of the past? Faster than you can say God is dead in a big mustachioed accent. We've accumulated a lot of baggage. Idea baggage. Ideas that we carry forward and we are not always sure what to do with, but we can't just throw it all away. No. No matter what. We are going to carry that weight. So when destiny dissolves, what do we do with a radical, even absurd human freedom where we don't have any real pre-made roles or faith to believe in? That from original birth to the death of our innocent childhood, and from that first apocalyptic death all the way to our final apocalyptic death, we are but tiny boats on a vast, uncaring sea, guiding our own sails? <laughs> What do we do with a drunken sailor? What do we do with a drunken sailor? What do we do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? Well, we might make new myths. Heck yeah! Out with the old myths and in with the new myths! Let's feel it in our bones, man! We want something romantic, something jazzy. We want something postmodern. Yeah, baby! Something truly revolutionary! Enter Revolutionary Girl Utna. Viva la anime! Woo! From June 1996 with the first serialization of Chio Saito's manga to August 1999 with the release of the Adolescence of Utena film, Revolutionary Girl Utena lived and breathed in manga, light novels, musicals, a video game, an anime series where people turn into cows, and an anime movie where people turn into cars. So if you've never watched Utena and aren't sure you'd be interested, if you've seen the anime but aren't really sure what you just saw, or if you've scoured the internet for years and poured over all the essays and all the theory videos looking for answers... Thank you, Giovanna! <clears throat> there's a little something for you in this video, regardless of your level of knowledge and experience with all things Utena. Note, we are going to show clips from Utena today, but this video will avoid clear spoilers of major plot events. Don't worry, all we're going to do is give you context and information without ruining the show for you. So, kick back and buckle in! Pinky up! and pelvic thrust because I'm Khalil and I'm the Unplugged Professor and this is a spoiler free introduction to Revolutionary Girl Utena. God help our souls. Above all else, we feel that Utena can be best described as a modern myth. If we are to go deeper, we need to be clear on what a myth is and that also means looking at a few examples of other modern myths. Let's say we define a myth or fairy tale as a traditional story that explains the unexplainable or gives a moral lesson. That seems reasonable enough, right? But then we run into a weird reality. Many myths are made out of myths, and often the moral comes before the myth that explains it. In other words, we use myths and fairy tales to explain our traditions, and then those myths themselves become our traditions. And then we use those traditions to make new myths. It's all a cycle, right? Often, when I hear the word myth or fairy tale, I instinctively think of something old, like hundreds or even thousands of years old. I think of things like Aesop's fables, Grimm's fairy tales, the Odyssey. But while we might like to think we've outgrown myths, that they were these things told to children generations ago, 
We want to put forward the idea here that myths are something we still make and still yearn for psychologically. Storytelling is the essential human activity. The harder the situation is, the more essential it is. While we might not all agree that it is the singular essential human activity, O'Brien's claim that we use stories to make it through life, especially when life gets hard or confusing, might make a lot of sense to you. We use myths to explain our worlds, they're not just a thing of the past. And if we're living in a changing world, it would make sense that our myths would change too. Often, we breathe new life into old myths by imbuing them with new intentions. Imagine you're a writer or director living in the 1990s or 2000s, and you wanted to make a modern myth. How would you do it? For ideas, let's take a look at a couple of film examples from around the time period in which Utena was released. First, let's take the Kubrick-turned-Spielberg film AI Artificial Intelligence. In this 2001 science fiction story, a young robot boy wants his mother to love him. And he feels that the only way he can really get her to love him is if he becomes a real boy. So inspired by the Disney verified story of Pinocchio, which itself is a mythical story with life lessons, the robot boy goes on a journey to find his own blue fairy. The movie AI is clearly influenced by the classic story of Pinocchio, but in making it about a robot boy in a science fiction world, Spielberg and company have recontextualized the myth so now it addresses the more recent question of what counts as a human being in an age of rapidly advancing technology and artificial intelligence. And on that note, what being human even means. But sometimes the myth makers don't want to play their hands so obviously with how they recycle old myths. You don't have to straight up invoke by name one specific myth for the new story to still be a myth of its own. For our second example, let's consider Peter Weir's 1998 film The Truman Show where we don't see one particular myth being used, but instead the film features biblical imagery and religious tones. The Truman Show is about a man who finds out a world-shattering truth, that his whole life has been a TV show directed by a manipulative man named Kristoff. Truman realizes this, and he begins to question his very reality, not unlike the characters of Utena. While the film can be entertaining to an audience on a literal level, as a film about Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey in a TV show, The Truman Show is also a parable. It's in the names. Truman is the true man, or every man who must carve out his own identity. And the antagonist is Kristoff, an off-Christ or an antichrist figure. The film uses religious imagery to tell a story that's not conventionally religious. An ordinary man opposing the social structure around him and going against fate and his own creator. Not only does the film use the traditions and mythos of Judeo-Christian archetypal imagery, but it also deconstructs them. Both AI and The Truman Show are modern myths that say something about the modern world. AI uses Pinocchio to address new questions of artificial intelligence, and The Truman Show uses religious imagery to discuss invasive reality television and how someone's life could be manufactured as media for others to consume. That said, Revolutionary Girl Utena is more like The Truman Show, in the sense that both are myths that use general ideas as their base, rather than a specific story like Pinocchio. But what are the general ideas Utena uses and comments on? Well, first, Utena frequently opens episodes with a flashback to this fairy tale origin story for its titular character, Utena Tenjo, in which Utena as a young girl meets a prince who kisses away her tears even though admittedly it looks more like he's drinking them. Much of Utena's motivation throughout the whole series stems from this drive to meet the prince, and at the same time, to also be the prince herself. So one half of Utena's mythological base consists of fairy tale prince and princess stories. The show assumes you have an understanding of the stereotypical prince, on a white horse who chivalrously saves princesses and young women from the evil of the world. Because, as the show continues, these ideas are going to be brought into light, and into questioning more and more. The second half of Utena's mythological base is composed of shoujo anime as a genre. Shoujo anime is simply anime aimed for girls in Japan. Unlike shonen, which is targeted at a young male demographic, shoujo in the 1980s and early 1990s tended to be less focused on combat and more focused on relationships. It's not really too different from what we see in American cartoons typically aimed at girls versus cartoons aimed at boys. There are exceptions, but generally it's relationship drama over fighting. 
What Utna does is build on a trend that had been pushing shoujo anime as a genre further toward complex themes of gender identity and toward more traditionally masculine combat scenarios, while still maintaining relationships as important to the work. Previously, the shoujo anime The Rose of Versailles, which ran from 1979 to 1980, starred a female protagonist who was raised to be a male son, and trained in sword combat to such a degree that her abilities would excel most of her male opponents. Likewise, Udna would also go on to star a female heroine, who would adopt a male persona and would become an exceptionally capable swordswoman, and this is not to mention how both works have a certain French flavor. After The Rose of Versailles, we have Sailor Moon, which started airing in 1992. Sailor Moon, in addition to being a career highlight for some of the key players who would go on to create Utna, also continued what The Rose of Versailles championed, by featuring a cast of female characters engaged in combat scenarios in order to protect others. Both The Rose of Versailles and Sailor Moon paved the way for anime with female heroes who could talk romance but also kick butt, and Utna takes full advantage of this new trend. And when we say that Utna is a modern or postmodern myth, all we're trying to say is that by the late 1990s, old ideas of what is considered male versus what's considered female were being challenged more and more. This is true in America, this is true in Japan, and yes, it's more complex than we're going to get into, but the point is that old myths just wouldn't work quite the same way anymore. The creators of Utena and the audience who had become fans of the series were now living in a world where it wasn't obvious anymore what a man supposedly could do that a woman can't do, and in a world like that, the series invites important questions. What does it mean to be a prince or princess now? What does it mean to be a boy or to be a girl? What does it mean to grow up in this world which isn't always easy and isn't always clear, which sometimes gets confusing and painful? What does it mean to bring about revolution? Mix one part prince myth and one part shoujo anime tradition within the womb of a postmodern late 1990s context, and the stylish love child Utna has conceived a new, modern myth that not only uses princes and shoujo anime trends for its style, but also invites us to think about those traditions that it's using. This particular video won't delve too deep into theories of what Utna is trying to say specifically. After all, we'd have to spoil the whole plot for that. Which means we're saving that analysis for the next nine videos in this ten-part series. So tabling that for now, we're going to move on to the people who made Utena. Modern myths don't make themselves, after all. People have to work hard to make the story come to life, to give it energy, to birth it into being. Well, get Dad out of the room before he faints, because we're about to witness that birth. Following working on the hugely successful Sailor Moon, the young and idealistic anime director Kunihika Ikahara decided to take a more independent approach for his next project and start a small team that could create something riskier and more avant-garde than Sailor Moon, while still continuing Sailor Moon's female fighting spirit. Ikahara assembled a group that would come to be known by the legendary and hilariously silly name V Papas. Hey Papas formed in 1996 specifically to create what would become revolutionary girl Utna, although the group would later to go on to create less known works like the illustrated novel Shonen O, oh, The Boy King, and the manga World of S&M. Hey Papas has four key members we wish to highlight in particular, Kunihika Ikahara, Yoji Inakido, Shinya Hasegawa, and Chiyo Saito. Note that while much of our focus today will be on Ikahara's contributions, each of these four members created the Utena we know, or at least pretend to know, depending on who's asking. In other words, they are all responsible for making Utena, and if you remove one of them from the picture, it wouldn't be the same Utena without them. We're going to save the first key member, Kunihiki Ikahara, for later, since we have a whole lot to say about him in particular in our next section. Second then is Yoji Enikido. Enokido is credited with animation composition, and he is the chief screenwriter for Utena. While Ikahara is credited with much of the tone the series takes, Enokido wrote 20 of the 39 episodes of Utena, as well as the screenplay for the film. 
Aside from being responsible for half of the writing of Utena, Enokita also worked on the script for four early episodes of Neon Genesis Evangelion, the script and novelization for Fuli Kuli, and the screenplay for the film Razaphon Pluralitas Consentio. Of all the members of Bee Papas, Enokito has had the longest running history with Ikahara, since Enokito and Ikahara went to the same high school together the same year. The story goes that, after deciding he wanted to pursue some of the ideas in his head that didn't make it into Sailor Moon, Ikahara recruited his friend and colleague Yoji Enokito, who also worked on Sailor Moon with him. Ikahara brought his vision and direction, and Enokito brought his experience in animation composition and screenwriting, and aid in storyboarding. Their colleague and friend Shinya Hasegawa would design characters, guide the art direction, and aid in storyboarding. Hasegawa is credited for the unusual style of character animation in the series and film, and he would later go on to be involved again with Ikahara as a key animator for Muadu Penguin Drum. This original trio walked off of Sailor Moon and sought out a manga artist to make their new ideas a reality. Finally, the last major Bee Papa's member we wish to highlight. Enter Chiyo Saito. Ikara came across the art of Chiyo Saito by complete accident. He happened to notice her work in a magazine one day and it immediately captured Ikara's attention and imagination. Ikara, joined by fellow Bee Papa's member Yuichiro Oguro, approached Saito in a family restaurant as strangers. All they could offer her were vague ideas on this ambitious new project, which as of yet wasn't well defined and was more of a feeling than a hard, clear concept. While Ikahara, Oguro, Enikido, and Hasegawa had experience on successful shows like Sailor Moon, at this time they were still young and lesser known in the anime industry, so you can about imagine what someone in Saito's shoes might have been feeling when she listened to them. As Chiyo Saito recalled from an interview, she had expected to be meeting with an aged man with experience, but instead... When I got there, a blonde rock boy was sitting there daintily with Oguro, who she described as a hefty man, making them a fun visual pair to look at. With ambitions that impressed Saito, she says, It felt like I was dragged into this strange world. Ikara later confessed, I had absolutely nothing planned. Remarkably, however, their energy clicked with Saito, who became an essential asset to be Papas and would go on to craft the Utena manga. At this time, we want to mention some of the lesser discussed members of Bee Papas, the screenwriters who helped write the parts of the show not written by Enikido. If you like the absurd humor of Utena, Hiyoshi Nishikiori, which is not his real name, was responsible for the visual gags like the balloons in episode 11. He also storyboarded the infamous Nanami episodes, the Cowbell of Happiness and Nanami Say. If you're a fan of Jury as a character, Katsuyo Hashimoto, whose real name is Mamoru Hosoda, storyboarded two of the four Jury-centric episodes, earning him the nickname, The Jury Man. Jugo Kazuyama, who is really Takia Ikarashi, has had a long history with Ikahara and storyboarded key episodes of the series, including episodes 9, 25, 30, and 37, as well as storyboarding and writing the script for episode 19, the Onion Prince episode, which is unique within the Black Rose arc of the story for a few reasons that are spoilery. And last of these underappreciated lost souls is Noboru Higa, really Yamaguchi Ryota, quote, a screenwriter whose identity is a mystery, and who had a hand in the script for almost all of the Nanami-centric episodes. Note also that in terms of the projects made after Utena, Bee Papas wasn't a one-man show with Ikahara. Ikahara and Chiyo Saito made World of SNM, while it was Enikido and Hasegawa, the Evangelion boys, who collaborated for The Boy King. With Ikahara in the director's chair, Enikido driving the script forward, and Hasegawa guiding the art direction along with Oguro and Saito, one of the last major players in the creation of Utena was the man who would supply the now-famous battle music for the series. While never technically a member of Bee Papas, fans recognized J.A. Caesar as a core contributor to the project. Caesar made a name for himself composing soundtracks to the 1960s and into the 1980s for theater director Shuji Teriyama and the independent theater group Tenjo Sajiki. Caesar specialized in rock covers and the kind of avant-garde dramas that Igara grew up on. While Caesar may not have written all of the songs for the show specifically, Igara himself was influenced by Caesar's work. So, even when the songs weren't made for Utna, it's entirely possible Utna was made for the songs. Ikara stated they matched dual songs to the character's personality, going as far in an interview as to even explain how the lyrics in the second Sionji duel relate to the character of Sionji. 
And it's not just Ikahara making up weird connections in his head either, because in the same interview, Enokido was the one explaining that the line he holds up Paleozoic within his body refers to how Sionji is bound by old-fashioned ideals. Ikara can also be credited with coming up with the names of the albums and often the names of the songs on the soundtracks not penned by Caesar himself. Ikara had been a fan of J.A. Caesar for over 20 years before asking him to work on Utna, so for the director, Caesar's involvement was a particular dream come true. Later, when discussing getting to work with J.A. Caesar, Ikara reflected, That was the happiest part of making Utna. Note that, unless our research is mistaken on this account, all of the key members of B-Papas were within four years of each other in age, all in their late 20s and early 30s when creating Utna. Aside from the veteran J.A. Caesar, not a technical member, this was a young team with new ideas and big aspirations. Before B-Papas dissolved in the early 2000s, they were a tightly knit team unified by a similar creative vision of trying something different and putting all their hearts into this avant-garde project. I think we've done a good job stressing that Ikahara, while the director, can't be credited alone as the creator of Utena, and that it was the team that made the series what it is, not just one person. Now, with all that said, let's talk about how Kunihik Ikahara totally deserves all the credit for the series and is a fabulous god among mortal men. Manga artist Chio Saito says that prior to joining B. Papas, she had been reading a lot of philosophy and wondering about her own future. When she started working with Ikahara and Akito Hasegawa and the rest of B. Papas, she was surprised to learn that everyone had read many of the same books and everyone had approximately the same outlook on life. When asked who came up with the story for Revolutionary Girl Utsuna, Ikahara said that Everybody in B. Papas gathered together to create it. Kunihiko Ikahara is a liar. Meanwhile, Anakito, on the subject of B. Papa's group chemistry, said, We have this mutual agreement to betray each other depending on the situation, and that's probably why we get along so well with each other. There exists within B. Papa signs of an odd tension. On one hand, Ikahara will adamantly insist that they were all friends, that there really isn't such a thing as an auteur director who gets all the credit for making an anime. On the other hand, there's also clear indications that Ikahara directed more than just the anime. He directed B. Papas to get them on his wavelength. During the planning stage, director Ikahara had devoted his passion to finding the best way to bring the world of Chio Saito's work to life in anime form. But at this point, he started really adding his own flavor to the show. The stage-like layout, the Shadow Girls, Jay Caesar's choral songs, and all the rest. With the injection of this Ikahara flavor, the show further expanded in leaps and bounds. Now that the manga and anime had both started up, Miss Saito has been pulling Revolutionary Girl Utena in a romantic direction, and director Ikahara has been pulling it in the direction of his own tastes. And even as he aids both of them in their tug of war, Yoji Anikido incorporates his tastes as well. It's fair to say that the basic flavor of Revolutionary Girl Utena is formed from the individual personalities of these three people. Ikara, Saito, and Enokido. Oguro. And yet, Oguro would go on to suggest that these mismatching tastes were deliberately sought out by Ikahara to create what he called a twofold mismatch that would give the anime its, quote, mysterious flavor. Because they believed that the most interesting works have an element of mismatch. In all likelihood, this is probably how it played out. Everyone contributed their own flavor. But they did this on Ikahara's terms, because that was his plan. He brought these people together, and he drew out from them the elements that he wanted. Whenever they disagreed, it actually made Ikahara so stressed that he would become seriously ill. Ikahara also would make concessions sometimes. For example, much as he wanted the two female leads, Utna Tenjo and Anthe Hememia, to be a romantic couple, when Shio Saito threatened to quit if that became a reality, Ikahara backed off and let Saito make the main series manga clearly non-Yuri, clearly non-Yaoi, and even in the anime, romantic readings between the two can be implied, but they aren't explicitly confirmed. However, once Ikahara had more control over the film script, well, if you've seen the movie, then I think it's safe to say we know what Ikahara really wanted all along. Do we really 
So if we're going to make the claim that Ikahara is the most important mine behind Utena, what kind of a mad scientist genius even is he? That is our Ikahara. Around the time of Utna's production and release, when asked which American filmmakers he would most like to work with one day, Ikahara said that Stanley Kubrick was one of his favorites, and that David Lynch would also be someone he would like to work with. Kubrick is known for his strong sense of visual directing, which sometimes veers into the abstract and horrifying. His films often show much more than they clearly explain. And if you asked Kubrick to elaborate on the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey, or on the ending of The Shining, he would likely insist that they are open to interpretation, that if he got it right, the image should speak for itself. Kubrick tried to reach people on a subconscious level, which is something David Lynch, the other previously mentioned influence in Ikahara, has arguably based his entire film career on. Lynch, most famous for films like Eraserhead, Blue Velvet, and Mulholland Drive, as well as the TV series Twin Peaks, often mixes nightmarish, surreal imagery and darker themes with bizarre, incredibly weird humor, resulting in worlds that can be described as more dreamlike than reflective of reality. Through his creative use of imagery, David Lynch is the kind of director who can make blue boxes and red light bulbs and ceiling fans iconic centers of tension and mystery. So, like Kubrick and especially Lynch, Ikahara as a director and story crafter likes to leave things open to interpretation, and he isn't afraid to get weird. He trusts that his audience will just get it. Even if they can't explain it clearly in words, he trusts that they will feel it in their gut. Whether Ikahara himself can even explain his ideas in clear words is also unclear, since often in interviews he trails his ideas, and it seems like he might have forgotten the vast majority of whatever it was he'd been thinking back when he made the work. So is Ikahara a genius or a lovable weird idiot? Well, like many things in the work he makes, especially in Utena, the truth may lie along that edge of seeming contradiction. In other words, yeah, he's probably both a genius and a weird, lovable idiot. Following the release of the film Adolescence of Utena, Ikahara went to the United States to learn English and attend school at the American Film Institute. When Shizuki Yamashita followed Ikahara around during his time in the United States, from March to September 2001, Yamashita kept what he called an Akuni observation journal on his blog. Yamashita relates at length how excited Ikahara was about living in an apartment with three jacuzzis. And sure enough, his excitement for pools and chasing after girls shows up not just in this outside observer's journal, but also in Ikahara's interviews from the time period. While Ikahara can be cryptic about the symbolic imagery in his films, he can also be terribly straightforward when it comes to what he likes and wants outside of his art. For example, he really likes pillows. This isn't the only interview we found in our research where he's talking about pillows. He really, really likes good pillows. Ikahara also apparently showed up late to many of his meetings, either by oversleeping or often just forgetting the meeting was going to happen altogether. According to the Akuni Journal, Ikahara drives like a madman, and the only clothes that fit him in America were for girls. But his Kubrick-inspired Lynchian surrealism, which shows a great deal of artistic intelligence and craft, and his simple, maybe even foolish demeanor as some confused, forgetful, rambling rock star who appreciates good pillows, how do these disparate elements in Ikahara connect? Utena is someone I wish I could be. I want to be a fool. I want to be ignorant. I want to be naive. Anthe is, to me, the embodiment of reality. I can't reveal the motivation, but to give you a little hint, it'll be something fun. I want to pursue a value of fun for its own sake. I think my generation, as well as the younger generation, lacks imagination. 
in a world that's dark, confusing, and often beyond our understanding, kind of like a David Lynch film, wouldn't you want to be around someone who still has that childlike wonder? If you were making art, whether it's anime or otherwise, wouldn't you appreciate someone to guide you along the creation process? Someone who, above all else, wants to pursue fun for its own sake. Ikahara explores his imagination thoroughly, and this is likely why a lot of his anime feels so individual and unique. With each work being distinct, but also having that similar Ikahara flavor, that's probably because Ikahara puts himself wholly into his art, without reservations. He isn't afraid to make himself look bad or dumb, he puts his bad or dumb or weird elements on the forefront. I feel each of the characters is my alter ego. The Shao Play girls are my friends. Those girls come from planet Kashira, and they often talk to me via radio waves. Almost every day. As we watched Utna with this in mind, it became clearer to us how much this mindset pervades the work. Ultimately, Ikahara will deny that he deserves all the credit. When asked about creators in animation, Ikahara replied, That's just an illusion. And actually, in the anime business, no such thing as a creator is anywhere to be found. All there are are people who were brought along by the founding of the system. The people who devised the form of anime today. Ikahara, in this interview and in others from around the time, adamantly denied that he was creating art. And he decried that all anyone in his generation that is, the anime industry of the 1990s, the same industry that would go on to birth works like Utena, Evangelion, and Cowboy Bebop, that all anyone making anime in that era could be credited for was recycling old ideas. But that's a myth, right? Recycling traditions and old ideas to form new stories? Earlier, we defined a myth or fairy tale as a traditional story that tries to explain the unexplainable or teach a lesson. Myths and fairy tales use the traditions of the past and the realities of the present to craft new visions, and in making something new out from the old, that too can be art. Evangelion wasn't the first mecha anime, but it did something with the tradition originally set forth by Gundam and Macross. Cowboy Bebop wouldn't be possible without Lupin III or Blade Runner, but when the disparate elements of cowboy, sci-fi, jazz, and fused existentialist drama were blended together, a new genre was created, and this new genre would go on to be called Cowboy Bebop. The same with Evangelion, the same with Cowboy Bebop. Ikahara was a visionary of the 1990s anime scene, who took the traditions and mythos of anime's past and made something new out of it. Take a bit of J.A. Caesar's music, a bit of theatrical shadow play, a bit of Rosa Versailles, a bit of this, a bit of that. And sure, you could just say it's recycling old ideas, but that's art too. When Mr. Ikahara and I started working together, I realized he was actually quite serious about his work. He's also a very pure person. I don't mean childish. I mean that I believe he's kept his inner child there inside him all along. Mr. Ikahara treasures things like childhood memories very much, I think. I feel like he treasures those things as he creates his shows. Me? I don't remember anything about when I was little. Chio Saito. What I often get told by director Ikahara was, I want to avoid doing anything moralistic if I can. He wanted to exclude what the public at large regards as good judgment. Kasayama. You could call Kunihiko Ikahara an idiot, a master manipulator, or a madman. But he might also be a creative genius. And maybe, for this rock star director, those aren't all mutually exclusive terms. Evidently, Ikahara had originally wanted to include two personalities in the main character, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't integrate them together into one character. So he split them into two people, and the result was the birth of Anthe. In other words, the character Utna, as she was originally conceived, included the personalities of both the current Utna and Anthe, Yuichiro Oguro. Everything with Utna appears to begin with the characters Utna and Nanthi, and how each of them is involved with the archetypes of prince, princess, and witch. 
You could even argue that Chikasa Sanjuin, a character exclusive to the Sega Saturn Utna game, is effectively a combination of Utna and Anthe. But more on her some other day, huh? Igar and Bipapa started with this idea of Utna, a female protagonist who fought to protect people. Chiyo Saito said it was initially going to be a children's show, but after six months, the story suddenly shifted, and she started to feel out of the loop in the process and worried that it wasn't going to be successful or profitable with the direction it was taking. She believed in Ikahara, however, and remained on board. Ikahara even told her that, when it came to the manga, as long as it followed the basic plot, she could draw whatever she liked. Here's something I've thought ever since I was in school. School is a weird landscape, you know? It's extremely theatrical, isn't it? This notion of school as theater would become important to the ethos of the show, which goes away from the realistic portrayals of school and instead imagines school as larger than life. The film takes this to a whole other level with M.C. Escher nightmare stares. And if the theater is a school, then the actors are the students, especially the student council duelists. Ogoro states in the Laserdisc liner notes that during a meeting in New Year's Day of 1996, with Ikara not feeling well, Enokido and Saito together decided on the concept of the Rose Bride, the rules for the duels, the names of the duelists, and what Ogoro describes as the setup and broad strokes of the story. As alluded to earlier, a major disagreement on with Utna was whether the main heroines, Utna and Anthe, would be romantically interested with each other. Saito vetoed Ikahara's ideas of them being lovey-dovey from the start and was clear she wanted to cater the manga to young girls specifically and thought Yuri elements would hurt the story's appeal to that audience. The actual process behind the scenes for the creation of Utna appears to be a balance of improv and Ikahara's vision. Inukita reballs that they would often hand screenwriters unreasonable script orders such as Do something that'll throw off the people watching which resulted in situations like in episode 8, where a personality transfer type of story randomly revolved around magical Indian curry just to enhance the weird factor. Ikara took the team to experimental theater shows and tried to get them all in the same mindset, which allowed them to establish, as assistant director Shingo Kaneko explains, a common language, or rather a shared set of values between everyone on staff. Since nobody could tell where we'd end up, every day there were these endless meetings that went on into the early hours. The good thing about that, though, is that Utna didn't turn into Mr. Ikahara's one-man show. He got as much consensus as possible at each stage. That fostered a mutual sense of trust. Among other things, if he asked you to take care of something, he'd leave it to you. Shinya Hasegawa. Revolutionary Girl Utna is most famous as anime, but you might find that the manga, a film, a Sega Saturn game, two light novels, and several musicals are really worth looking into. These were all made around the same time as each other during the late 1990s, with the notable exception that there are new musicals happening literally now, and in 2018, three separate epilogue manga stories were released under the banner of After the Revolution, and serve as a follow-up to the series. Quick side note, the musical productions have some really sick names that translate to, like, Hell Rebirth Apocalypse, Advent of the Nirvonic Beauty, and Chorus of Imaginary Living Body. It's important to mention that the anime, manga, film, games, light novels, and musicals don't all exist within the same exclusive universe. What we mean is that the stories do differ a lot, so it's not like the manga and anime are direct adaptations of each other, and although the animated film was released after the anime, it is not a traditional sequel. If you've seen the film, you would know that this is a fairly obvious comment to make and isn't really up for a lot of debate. And if you're still willing to debate, I'm glad to roll up my sleeves, take you around the back, and show you exactly! Depending on your experience with media in your life, this might seem strange. Well-established romantic relationships in the anime aren't in the manga. Some characters exist in one form of the story, and not in all of the others. Some versions of the story are more overtly subversive in their depictions of gender and sexuality, and the tone of the Sega Siren game is light, while the tone of the anime can get very dark. After all, Chika Sasanjuin is a perfect angel, did nothing wrong, and is not to be suspected of absolutely any ulterior motives. Why do this? Here are two perspectives to consider that might frame this in an interesting context. Returning to the idea that revolutionary girl Utna is a modern myth, we can compare this to Greek mythology. Within one Greek myth, you might see a certain hero or god depicted in one way very clearly, and in another work, adapted by another Greek storyteller, you might have a version of that character that varies a little bit, sometimes significantly. 
You also see later authors adapt classic Greek myths and characters into new contexts. And obviously this isn't just Greek either. Despite all their differences, Satan in the Bible, Satan in Dante's Inferno, Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost, and Lucifer in Supernatural are all the same archetypal character. Similarly, take a mythical character from a comic book universe, literally anyone, like Batman. It's not like one author has the monopoly over what is and isn't Batman. There are many, many different versions of Batman. One comic author might treat Batman one way, and another author may take Batman in a totally different direction. Both are still Batman stories. Not only is Batman still Batman, even when comparing wildly different comic stories, but he is also still Batman whether it's Christian Bale, Ben Affleck, Adam West, or Kevin Conroy. So, Revolutionary Girl Utna is kind of like a Greek myth or a Batman comic. There are different versions, each with their own ideas and variation on the characters, and not one of them is more canon or definitive than the others. That's why you end up with characters like Toga Kiryu being not quite the same character in each version of Utna, and each has been taken as separate as different versions of Batman. One Batman kills, one Batman doesn't. These aren't normal inconsistencies if they are actually separate stories to tell. You dig? If you won't take our word for this, Ikahara said that the imagery in the film is meant to be different from the show specifically so that people wouldn't see the film as a continuation and would still work for first time viewers. This results in complex and varied portrayals of the same basic character type, whether intentional or not. I decided to operate according to the rule, never give a character only one personality. I didn't want to reject fun on the grounds of, I can't get this character to be uniformly consistent. Kunihiko Ikahara. Revolutionary Girl Utna is a series intended to be interpreted openly and creatively. Not only are versions of characters not consistent between the anime, manga, film, etc., but even within respective works you can find nuances and contradictions, especially within the anime where characters are potentially a lot more complex than they appear to be at first glance. You can interpret Utna along several layers, and Ikahara certainly didn't shy away from leaving viewers with conflicting feelings about some of the show's key characters. Revolutionary Girl Utna is a modern myth based on fairy tale princes and shoujo narrative. It has a lot to say about growing up, identity, relationships, gender, and cowbells. It is our sincere hope that if you haven't experienced Utna in full by this point, you would check it out if anything we've talked about has interested you, even in the slightest. If you have checked out the series already, then stay tuned, because we have some stuff planned for you in the next few videos. Hi everyone, thank you for watching our video. Thank you so much. This has been a very long time coming, honestly. It's been months, uh, close to a year, uh, well, over years for how much we've even just been planning it in the first place. And we wanted to make sure that this video we put out would be some kind of quality that we'd be proud of. And honestly, I've been really satisfied with how it turned out. and. Hope that you enjoyed it as well. I think that literal blood, sweat, and tears have actually been put into this product. Now, as much as we'd like to pat ourselves in the back, we'd also like to give a huge shout out to all the people who helped make this possible. Um, we relied heavily on the website Empty Movement and everything that they've done over like 20 years, however long it's been now, mm -hmm. to keep Utna's fandom alive and to preserve all the documents. So again, thank you, Giovanna. Thank you everyone at Empty Movement and everyone outside of Empty Movement, YouTube SAS, who've helped preserve and keep the community going. Honestly, just the vast majority of this video probably wouldn't be as possible without their overall support and love for this show um, and overall franchise. Our goal for this first video was that it'd be something someone could watch if they know nothing about Utna, as well as hopefully something that a veteran who's seen the show even multiple times would still get something out of. Um, this first video is going to be different than from the rest of the series. Uh, we don't know when the next one's going to come out. No. Could, could be five minutes from now, it could be five years from now. <laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. I think it's as unpredictable as our next subject matter, Mickey. <laughs> Mickey Kaoru. Mickey so, Kaoru. starting with the next episode, we're going to be looking at individual characters. So, if you haven't seen Utna, this video was cool for you. That's great. We're glad you're here. Mm -hmm. But for the next video between now and Whenever this next one comes out, we encourage you to watch the series if you're interested in. Uh, all the episodes are subbed on YouTube uh, by the uh, people who uh, 
distribute, mm-hmm. is that the phrase? Right, yeah. right. The, uh, those who distribute the video, if you will. So if you want to check that out, by all means. Elsewise, there is a very nice Blu-ray set available out there. Mm-hmm. And we also will be going over, just like this video did, we'll be going over manga, the game, the movie. Uh, the main focus is the series, um, but just be aware that there will be spoilers moving forward for all Utena content. Um, and we look forward to putting that together for you. So don't sleep, just consume absolutely everything. Empty Movement has everything ready for you, like thousands of pictures. Trust us, we know. Uh, It's beautiful. Uh, And again, our goal here is not to close off discussion. Yep, we did it, we figured out Utena, we know the meaning of the series now. Go home, guys. No, our goal is to open up discussion. So if there's something we say that you're like, these guys are horribly wrong, then, you know, Click clackety in your comments and make your own videos. Do do something like communicate your thoughts out there. This is not an end-all be-all. I mean, we tend to be horribly wrong, but regardless, Utna is a very interpretive series. Uh, people can really take away a lot of personal values from uh, the characters, the story beats, and so on. Um, I can speak for myself at the very least on that. And as far as our personal philosophy goes on interpreting fiction, even if Ikahara and Saito and Enikido and the ghostly apparition of Hasegawa were to come and to say, from on the mountain on high, this is what we meant by having, I don't know, the, the egg episode, we're not necessarily going to take their answer as the holy grail that needs to be preserved. We can say that the story might mean something different to us or to you than even what the creators intended. So moving forward, we'll quote Ikahara. Doesn't mean he has the full say. Yeah, death of the author, right? Right. Yeah. Um, that's really what we wanted to say at the end here. Uh, as the credits have scrolled, again, all these sources have made it possible for us and help us along the way. Um, thank you again for watching. Um, if you enjoyed this video, we would appreciate a like and a share. Well, already, I'm just appreciating they stuck through 40 minutes of content, so. Right, honestly. Um, with that said then, uh, stay tuned. And prepare for Absolute Destiny Apocalypse.